Revelation chapter 19. I welcome all of you on our North Campus along with our Dallas campus this morning. And here in Plano, Texas, Preston Wood, and online, all of you who are joining us, we welcome you. Marriage by God's design is a beautiful illustration of the relationship that we have with Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Those of us who believe and receive Him say yes to Him, have a relationship with Christ. We become His bride, His church, together and triumphant. And He is our heavenly bridegroom. And one day when Jesus comes, and we're in that section of the book of Revelation now where Jesus comes again to establish His eternal kingdom forever and ever. And when He comes, we will be eternally with Him. And one of the events that will take place when Christ comes or before His coming to earth will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. An incredible illustration in Revelation chapter 19 of this banquet, this beautiful wedding, wedding bells in heaven and the heavenly bridegroom, the Lamb of God, Jesus Himself receives us, His bride, uh, to be with Him forever. Marriage is an illustration of that relationship. This is why you can never change the definition of marriage. By God's design, marriage is between a man and a woman. Anything else is a pollution of that holy sacred union that God has established as the very foundation of society. Nothing else illustrates the relationship like marriage, God's way. So this past week at the Southern Baptist Convention, I led a group of former presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention representing 35 years of our most recent history, 17 presidents over that time. We united together and we were able to present a statement in lieu of and in view of the Supreme Court of the United States decision, upcoming pending decision on marriage. We felt that it was important to clarify our convictions regarding marriage as God designed it. Amen. And so we offered this statement, it has received quite a bit of news and comment and commentary. It is where we stand, it's where I stand, and I thought I would share it with you because this is where we as a church stand as well. As Southern Baptist Christians, we are committed to biblical faith and ethics. As a result, this body of believers stands on the authority of Scripture and God's truth as central to our lives. What the Bible says about marriage is clear, definitive, and unchanging. We affirm biblical, traditional, natural marriage as the uniting of one man and one woman in covenant commitment for a lifetime. The Scripture's teaching on marriage is not negotiable. We stake our lives upon the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Consequently, we will not accept nor adhere to any legal redefinition of marriage issued by any political or judicial body, including the United States Supreme Court. We will not. We will not recognize same-sex, quote, marriages, or our churches will not host same-sex ceremonies, and we will not perform such ceremonies. While we affirm our love for all people, while we affirm our love for all people, including those struggling with same-sex attraction, we cannot and will not affirm the moral acceptability of homosexual behavior or any behavior that deviates from God's design for marriage. We also believe religious freedom is at stake within this critical issue and that our first duty is to love and obey God and not man. Therefore, 
Therefore, we encourage all Southern Baptist pastors, and I might add all evangelical Bible-believing pastors and Christians, leaders, educators, and churches to openly reject any mandated legal definition of marriage and to use their influence to affirm God's design for life and relationships. As the nation's largest non-Catholic denomination with over 16 million members, we stake our very lives and future on the truth of God's Word. We also join together to support those who stand for natural marriage in the corporate world, the marketplace, education, entertainment, media, and elsewhere with our prayers and influence and resources. So here we stand, we can do no other. Ultimately, any redefinition of marriage is an assault on our faith. And not only that, but it is an attack on the will and the way of God. It is, in fact, a fist in the face of God. It is rebellion, and I shudder to think, as a dad and as a granddad, I am deeply concerned about our nation and its future if the Supreme Court of the United States tips us over and changes millenniums of history regarding marriage. So we pray and I invite you and I encourage you to pray and fervently pray and to graciously and compassionately and lovingly take your stand in the marketplace, the place where you work, your community, your uh, corporate office, your neighborhood, wherever you are, that you will use your influence for the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus. That's what I'm trying to do. So marriage, therefore, cannot be changed because it is eternal in the mind and the heart of God. And that is what the marriage supper of the Lamb represents, this union between Jesus our Lord, the Lamb of God, and we, His people who follow Him. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 19, the Scripture says, and after this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just, for He has judged the great prostitute. Remember the scarlet harlot riding on the back of the beast? That's false religion. Judged, who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more they cry out, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all His servants who fear Him small and great. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters. Think of a Super Bowl roar roar on the winning touchdown. Think of a thunderous night when lightning and thunderous clouds are emanating the noise of heaven, the loud, mighty peals of thunder crying out, it's loud, okay, in heaven. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, the angel said, you must not do that. I am your fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We are now engaged 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are engaged, we are preparing for the moment that we meet him and see him face to face. And that day when we share in this great wedding in the sky, this great wedding in the heavens, when angel choirs sing and wedding bells ring and the party is going to last forever. Let's talk about this celebration. Millions of people uh, will be there, people from all ages and stages of life and history, people from all nations and neighborhoods, every person in Christ from any place on earth. And we are all there for one reason, the blood of the Lamb, the grace of God. We gather around this table of the Lord, not because we deserve to be there, for none of us deserve to be in this place at that time, but because of what Christ and Christ alone has done for us. And because we are there, we burst into exuberant praise to God. And there's music. Every wedding, nearly every wedding has great music. Well, some not so great. I've heard a few of those as well. But every wedding should have beautiful and, and, and great music. Well, there's music at this wedding, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you know what it is? It's the Hallelujah Chorus. In fact, Handel got his inspiration from this very passage of Scripture. Hallelujah. Four times, four times the word hallelujah is given in Revelation 19. Interestingly enough, it's the only four times the word hallelujah is, is used in all of the New Testament. Now, it's used many times in the Old Testament because it is a Hebrew word. In fact, hallelujah is a, a transliteration of the Hebrew word. And it has to do with our worship of God. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Praise be to God. May God be praised. Hallelujah. Four times. Another word shows up that ought to show up more in church in our own generation. It's going to be in heaven. It's the word amen. Because not only do they sing hallelujah, they say amen. You have hallelujah and amen. This is the language of heaven. In fact, the words hallelujah and amen, they're the same in every language. No matter where you go on earth, if you can't communicate with that person in their language, then all you need to do if they're a Christian and you're a Christian is to say hallelujah and they get it. If they say amen, you know what they're talking about. It's hallelujah and amen. What is this hallelujah? There are, four, there are several stanzas to the hallelujah here. For one, we are celebrating, we are saying praise to God, celebrating our redemption in Christ. That's why verse 1 says, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Salvation. When we get to heaven, we will fully realize just how great our salvation really is. I came to Jesus as a small boy, six years of age, just six, a little guy. But I knew I wanted Jesus, needed Jesus in my life, and I said a simple childlike yes to him. I didn't know a lot, but I knew that I loved Jesus. And through the years, my love for Jesus has deepened. My understanding as who he is and what this salvation is about has obviously increased. And, and now I know more, and yet I'm still learning more and more about who Jesus is and just how great this salvation really is. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you are a brand new Christian, as many of you are, and you're just getting started in learning about and loving the Lord. Or whether like me, you've been a veteran, long time believer, this side of eternity, our, our understanding is, is still limited. But then when we see him face to face, when we know that our salvation is complete in Christ, we will say amen and hallelujah for the redemption that we have 
in Christ. There is nothing greater, nothing better than salvation in Christ. And you won't be in heaven five seconds until you are rejoicing forever at just how wonderful our Savior is. More and more, we realize it. Glory and power belong to Him alone. But not only hallelujah, that's the first stanza, but there's the, also the stanza in that we celebrate retribution. That's why in verse 2, for His judgments are true and just. Amen and hallelujah. God is the final arbiter. He is the judge. Isaiah 33 verse 22 says, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver and no one can change the laws of God. No one, no court, no judge, no cultural opinion can change the laws of God who is the judge. The Lord is our King. He will save us. So in heaven, we are going to praise God and say amen, which means so be it or let it be, let it be. Paul didn't think of that, God did. Let it be, let it be. Not the apostle Paul, the beetle Paul. (laughs) Amen, hallelujah. Because finally and fully sin is judged, evil is eradicated. No more shootings and Bible studies, killing innocent people. That's all going to be judged. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. My own father was murdered when I was 20 years of age. I had to deal with all the emotions related to that as a young man. But I determined that I would let God be the judge. And in my heart forgave the man who killed my father. I hope, but by the grace of God, I meet him in heaven someday. I hope. He comes to faith or has come to faith in Christ. I don't know. The point is that God will settle all the scores. Sometimes people question God and say, is God fair in the face of all this evil and tragedy and inexplicable, imponderable things that happen to people in life? Sometimes people want to say, is God just? Is God righteous? Why would God allow such evil in the world? But in heaven, when all evil is judged finally and fully and forever, we will say amen and hallelujah. No one in heaven will be saying God isn't fair. No one in heaven at the table of our Lord will say, God did the wrong thing. We will say, Lord, I understand what you did. And while I didn't understand it in life, I understand it in eternity. And I know that you had a greater plan for life, even my own. God will execute judgment and everyone will say, hallelujah, that's right. Hallelujah, amen, praise God. Our God is true and righteous and just. So we will celebrate retribution when judgment finally comes to evil and all who practice evil. We will say amen and hallelujah. Because of our redemption, salvation and honor and glory belong to the Lord, it's all because of Him. And then we will celebrate God's reign over the world. We will shout the victory in Jesus. Hallelujah, verse 6, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. The Lord God all-powerful reigns. It appears today at times that man is in charge, that Satan is on the prowl and is destroying whom he may devour. The Bible tells us that. It may appear that the God of this age, Satan, is in control, that demons rule. But at the end of the day, God will demonstrate that He is on His throne forever and ever, now and forever. And the theme of the book of Revelation is our God reigns, that Jesus rules. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Let me give you a spoiler alert to the end of the story. Jesus wins. 
and we share in our victory with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and hallelujah. You might want to say it right there. So that's the celebration. That's, that's the music and the splendor and the glory uh, of this experience. But, but he also shows us something about the preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb, for the marriage of the Lamb. John in verse 7 begins to describe this marriage. Everything is pointing to this date in prophecy, in life. The Lamb is the bridegroom who is Jesus Himself. The bride is the church. Now, in our weddings, for the most part, all the focus is on the bride. But in this wedding, all the focus is on the bridegroom. Our attention will be upon Jesus. And again, hear me, God chose the intimacy of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman to describe our eternal union with Him. And right now, we are in preparation for that marriage. The marriage has not yet been consummated. We are not yet in heaven with Him, but we are engaged to Him. We are betrothed to the bridegroom. He loved us first. The Bible says He loved me because I first, before I loved Him. And He wooed me and He won me to Himself. And there came a day in, in the life of every follower of Jesus when we said, yes, Lord, I commit my life to You. And we haven't seen our bridegroom yet. Peter says, yet having not seen Him, you love Him. We love Him and we long for His appearing. We long to be with Him. And what we do today in preparation for our wedding with Him is, is to prepare our lives, to know as much about Him as we can. That's the purpose of an engagement period, is to get to know each other better and better and better. Deb and I got married when we were college students, and I remember going down uh, to the jewelry store in Abilene, Texas, where we were students at Hardin Simmons University. I actually pawned my drum set uh, and a few other things try to get enough money to buy this ring. And I got some credit and uh, I bought this ring and, you know, you, I was so proud of that diamond, you, you could barely see it, but, you know, it, and I'm sure it wasn't the greatest quality if you took one of those gizmos and tried to look at it. It, it, it wouldn't be that great, but, but I put it on her finger in anticipation of our marriage and, and, and May 22nd this year has been 45 years and, and we still love each other and, you know, pretty much... Uh, Pretty much love at first sight, and, uh, but it's not love at first sight. It's when you've been looking at each other for four or five decades and you still love each other. That's, that's real love, and, and that's Deb Graham. You know, we had, a, we had an agreement when we got married, and, and that is, this is a good agreement, you know, for, for you young husbands, and that is uh, you, uh, we said, okay, I will make all the, ma me, I will make all the major decisions in our life, in our marriage. And Deb, you'll make all the other decisions. Now the fact is, we've had no major decisions to make in, <laughs> in our marriage, but we've gotten along just fine. But the engagement period is when you get to know each other and settle some of those things. And then the voice from heaven says, look, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. One of these days, we're going to be swept off our feet and enraptured into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will unite with him and, and be with him forever. He's made a promise to us when he engaged us to be married, put a ring on the finger, he said, you are mine and I am yours. My beloved is mine and you are my beloved. And there will be no breakups before the wedding. There will be no jilted brides. We will meet the Lord in the air. And so will we ever be with the Lord. And at the wedding feast, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to share a delicious victory together. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
I like that word supper. It's what we used to say down south. I used to hear my mother, well, I'd go out on my bicycle, play ball pretty much all day, but down the street, down the block, across town, I can hear my mother's voice. I think I got my preacher's voice from my mother. But I would hear her yelling, Jackie, is supper time. And I'd come running as fast as I could to supper time. So it's supper time. And the voice has called us upward and invited us to supper time. And people get all excited about what's going to be around the table. What are we going to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Is it going to be Krispy Kreme donuts and <laughs> chicken fried steak and gravy and mashed potatoes? You know, that's, uh, that's all a little bit silly, except, you know, you think about all the people that are going to be there around the marriage supper of the Lamb. There'll be guests there. John the Baptist said he was a friend of the bridegroom. You're not a guest at the marriage supper of the Lamb if you're a believer in Christ. You're the bride. You're the bride. But there will be guests. Old Testament saints will be there. Tribulation saints will be there. Can you imagine the conversation that's going to take, around, take up uh, uh, eternity in heaven? You know, you'll be sitting there and You'll say something like, you know, there's not much taste of this manna. Moses, would you pass the gravy? <laughs> My meat's a little uncooked. Elijah, would you put it on the fire just a little while longer? Lot, would you pass the salt? <laughs> and then coffee after dinner and conversation with David. David. Tell us that story about, again, how you kill the giant. But most of all, it's not going to be about the food, of course, or our conversation with others. It's all going to be about Jesus. Just like a bride keeps her eyes focused on the love of her life, so our hearts and our affections, our attention is given to Jesus. Something very interesting is mentioned regarding our garments at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 7 says, the marriage of the supper, marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready, clothed herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen, watch this, is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, let me give you a little lesson, a very important lesson about salvation and about righteousness. The, what is this, the righteous? If our garments are the righteous deeds of the saints. What is that talking, talking about? Well, first of all, we know we're saved by grace in Christ alone through grace and faith alone. We do not save ourselves. As the great hymn says, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. This is our position before God. We are righteous. We are pure, righteously pure because of the blood of Christ who has cleansed us from all sin. We stand before him perfectly pure and righteous. You are looking at a righteous man today. You say, well, you don't look all that righteous to me. In God's eyes, through Christ, I'm righteous. In fact, I'm a saint. You can call me Saint Jack. Well, you don't have to do that. But we're the saints of God. We're the righteous children of God. And the only way that you can go to heaven is to be dressed in this righteousness. This is what theologians call the, our positional righteousness before God in Christ. It's called justification. But there is a practical righteousness that must be expressed. Because we have been saved, we are now His workmanship created in unto good works. Grace doesn't, I mean, uh, works do not save, but the works that save, or the grace that saves, works. In other words, if you're saved, there will be evidence of your salvation. There will be, practically speaking, the righteous deeds of the saints. And that's what you're sowing today. That's what you're preparing today for eternity to invest by righteous deeds and acts in your future. It's the same kind of idea when Jesus spoke of laying up treasures in heaven. So there are three tenses to salvation. 
Past tense, I have been saved, that's justification. Present tense, I am being saved, that's sanctification, being made more and more like Christ. And then glorification, this is glorification. When I'm made like Christ, when we see Him as He is, we will be like Him. We are in the presence of the Lord, and we look like Him because we are with Him, the bride of Christ. And therefore, we in the meantime should be serving and working and sharing His love with others because every time we do, we're sewing our garments, our dress for the occasion. Are you serving God with your good works and your good deeds, or are you sitting and watching others do it? Paul talked about at the judgment seat of Christ, people being saved as of by fire, like Lot who escaped Sodom and Gomorrah with his life but lost everything, left everything behind. He had nothing to show for his life when he barely got out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. He was He was saved but singed by the fire. And there are a lot of people that are going to be in heaven like that. They've got nothing to show for their lives. They have no garments to wear. They're naked and ashamed. They're they're saved, but they're barely saved. I don't want to go to heaven like that. This bride, the bride of Christ, is to be presented spotless, without blemish, before the Lord. I want my life to be a beautiful testimony. When I stand before the heavenly bridegroom, I want my my radiance in Christ to, to, to speak of my love for Christ. And the saints, therefore, the bride of Christ will wear this beautiful garment, the righteous deeds of the saints, His righteousness. One final and brief word, and that concerns the consummation of this marriage. The consummation of this marriage says that the revelation says that all of it is about Jesus, all of it. Everything points to Him, and that's why those last verses say, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage of the Lamb. He said these words are faithful and true. Just in case you might be thinking, is this true? (laughs) Is this really going to happen? God said, write it down. It's true. You say, really, really? Yes, really. It's true. The true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. You ever made a social faux pas at a wedding supper or a wedding yourself? I've seen a few of those. You know, just a real social failure. Well, John makes a big mistake. He gets on his face to worship this angel. He's so overwhelmed that he just falls before this angel and begins to worship. The angel looks around and says, don't do that. You're going to get us both kicked out of here. Don't worship me. I'm just your fellow servant, and especially of those who testify of Jesus. That blesses me as a preacher of the gospel to know that that I have assistants, personal assistants called angels who enable and and at times have strengthened me uh, when I preach the gospel. There may be several of them up here right now cheering me on, helping me on. I can't see them. You can't see them. But angels are real. And yet angels are never to be worshipped. We're never to obsess over angels because they point us to Jesus. Worship God. For Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God equals Jesus. Jesus equals God. Worship Him and Him only. And when we see Jesus, when we are united with Him at the second coming, that's the consummation of the age. That's the consummation of our salvation. That's the completion. And we will be with Him and experience His love, His life eternally. 